2nd December, 1944. We are finally relieved by mountain troops. It is raining hard when their vehicles arrive. The Russians seem to know what we're up to because they open fire on us with their heavy artillery. Again, we suffer dead and wounded, and two of the vehicles are hit and become unserviceable. The drivers attempt to get away, but the thick mud makes this impossible. Our vehicle gets stuck and we have to get out and push it out of the morass. The distance the driver would normally cover in 15 or 20 minutes now takes two hours. Dog to rid, exhausted and depressed over the loss of so many good friends, we drag ourselves into our quarters. The first person to greet us is Katya. She has a surprise for us because a small gift had been laid on each of our bunks. A couple of cigarettes, some pages of writing paper, a packet of cigarette paper, and similar small items. She has probably scrounged these things from the mountain troops. Three bunks are now empty, two because of the wounded and one that was occupied by the tank infantryman Mersch. Katya has placed a small cross made of twigs on his belongings. We wonder how she could have known. 3rd December. Many of our men have been killed and the crosses on the cemetery increase daily. A lot are from the light support troops, whom I knew very well. I remember how happy and full of hope they were in France and later in Italy. Now they are no longer with us. It's particularly sad to learn that just a few hours ago, during the artillery barrage when we were being relieved, the good-humored Gefreiter Rudnik of the Schwadronstrup was unlucky enough to have been struck in the head by shrapnel, killing him. Now we think only of sleep. No one complains about that. 4th of December. Yesterday was like a holiday. We were able to wash, shave, and dress in clean clothes. The food was excellent. We had goulash with noodles and for dessert we had semolina pudding. We were also able to take our time washing our dirty uniforms and cleaning our weapons. We were even able to take a short afternoon snooze while it snowed outside. However, the snow didn't last long. It merely added to the slush of the bog. We laid planks along the path to the latrine so that we could at least get there with clean feet. Because of the losses we have suffered, individual squads and platoons are being reorganized. My second gunner is now Paul Adam, a tough soldier who was previously assigned to the Rotman Heavy Weapons Section. Willie Krauss goes to Fritz Hamann as his second gunner. Our volunteer helpers are transferred to the light supply trains, and in exchange we receive some of the mortar section crew members. These reassignments always bring some uneasiness, but it really doesn't matter much because, as a general rule, whether in quarters or on the line, we are a strongly knit unit. It's important to me that I keep my heavy machine gun. I would otherwise feel quite naked and unprotected and would undoubtedly become insecure and unsure of myself. I think our Ober has also decided that he can depend upon me, in spite of the fact that, as he told us, a couple of senior Obergefreiter are being assigned to us from the second squadron. They are also heavy machine gunners, but Fritz Hamann and I will keep our weapons in recognition of our performance over the past weeks. 5 to 9th of December. We have been assigned a new Schwadron chef. Because of the reduced sizes of the Schwadronen, the officer assignments within them often change. Our new commander, we all refer to him as the old man, has not apparently served in a frontline unit, although he pretends to have done. It is said that now and then he calls in all his subordinates and lectures them on military operations, which he learned at some military school or other. Otto, who, as a professional waiter, is often required to serve as a batman to the old man, tells us that he has a fad for foreign words. His lectures are delivered primarily in a so-called academic German, which is full of foreign words. Otto says that it makes him laugh when the Wachtmeister and other NCOs are asked if they understand and always answer, ja wohl, Herr Oberleutnant. And afterwards they ask Turnip what was said. Turnip is an unterfigure in the orderly room, who is also an academic. He got his nickname in Italy because instead of eating meat, he always ate vegetarian meals. So Turnip has to explain what the old man means by preventative attacks, proportional engagements, divergent front demarcations, and similar gems. The old man actually expects his soldiers to understand his posh language. Apparently, he has lived so long among his own kind that he is no longer able to speak clearly and concisely. Once, in front of an assembled group, he asked a tank grenadier who had only been with us three days if he had been able to integrate himself yet. The young soldier who came from Upper Silesia and spoke German in a rather humorous and twisted form looked at the old man in a rather quizzical manner, but then seemingly having understood, answered, I don't know yet, Herr Oberleutnant. 
We could see that the old man had not expected this answer. He therefore asked, Why not? You've been here with us for three days. Ja wohl, Herr Oberleutnant, answered the man, but I only got my first black crap tablet two hours ago. The entire group just howled with laughter. The soldier thought the old man had asked him if the charcoal tablets had helped his diarrhea. The old man laughed with us, of course, but he didn't realize that we were laughing over the delightfully down-to-earth answer to the posh way the question was put to him. The old man had, of course, only wanted to know if the soldier had found himself at ease in our group. After this episode, the Upper Silesian Panzergrenadier, his name was Josef Spitka, was the subject of many a joke. We called him Peronje. He often used this word because it apparently covered many subjects, but what it actually meant not even he could tell. Peronje soon became a close friend. He was always dependable, and even in the frontline trenches, he had such an aggressive nature that we often had to hold him back to keep him out of danger. 14th of December. Last night was quite an occasion. You could hear the men laughing out loud as if someone had just told a terrific joke. In many of the barracks, you could hear loud singing throughout the night, intermingled with the sound of an accordion. It reminded me of Unteroffizier Döring near Ritschow, who played almost identical tunes. Soldiers' songs, often merry and joyful, but sometimes sad and moving. Everybody then quietened down, becoming immersed in his own thoughts, asking himself if he could join in with the singing next time round. To cope, many turned to the brandy bottle. They carried on drinking until they were legless, then collapsed onto their bunks and fell asleep. Waldemar Krekel and Obergefreiter Koshinsky were two of them. Where on earth did they find all that brandy? They seemed to have discovered a never-ending supply. Every so often, one of them would disappear, only to reappear shortly afterwards with a fresh bottle. Once I sniffed at the bottle and it made me feel quite sick. Fritz Hamann said it was Samagonka, a Russian home-produced brandy of some sort, made out of corn or often beet. You can buy it from the Russian volunteer helpers who work in the kitchen for the infantry. Now I know. They guzzle the wretched stuff here in the barracks area, straight from the source as it were, because they know that when they are up at the front line they can't get more than a sip or two. 15th of December. We have had sharp frost for a few days now and the streets are once again passable. Yesterday it even snowed, and you can feel Christmas in the air. This will be my second Christmas in Russia. Maybe we'll be lucky and can celebrate it here in our quarters. 16th of December. Today we covered all available vehicles with white chalk so as to camouflage them. For our next engagement, we have turned our camouflage battle dress inside out so that the white lining is showing. I'm off with Weichert and Paul Adam for a few minutes to the reorganized mortar section. Warius has told us that they have three new men from another squadron there. They are supposed to be old hands who have quite a bit of experience. Even before we go into their Russian cabin, a pleasant smell of chicken meets our noses, surprisingly as requisitioning poultry or anything else in the village is strictly prohibited. Nevertheless, a hearty chicken soup is being boiled up. I can see Weichert licking his lips. As we go into the hut, the men are just lying or sitting around having their soup. Some are holding chicken bones in their hands and gnawing at them feverishly. After a short greeting and introduction, Weichert asks curiously, Incidentally, Warius, where does this heavenly grub come from? Instead of Warius, an Obergefreiter who introduces himself as Bernhard Kubat stops eating and says to Weichert, Where from? Well, three turkeys suddenly came flying in through the window and perched on Matka's soup saucepan. The darned things wouldn't go away. See? Weichert looks at him dumbfounded, and we all laugh. The feathered inhabitants around here are very domesticated, you know, the Obergefreiter continues while gnawing away at his chicken. Of course, we were really upset because the poor things were freezing cold and just wanted to hang around and warm themselves up. The entire group grin in approval, and many of them start chuckling. The Obergefreiter point towards the outside with his half-gnawed chicken bone. It was certainly too cold for them outside, what with the snow and ice and all that. Kubit shrugs his shoulders. Weichert, who is secretly hoping to get hold of a bit of the prized chicken, plays along and asks, Yes, and then... The Obergefreiter scratches his flushed forehead and says slowly, Well then, I naturally granted them their request for warmth and merely... He pretends to twist their necks with his hands, because I could not, of course, have put live chickens in the pot. 
You do see, don't you? Weikert grins and says, Right, then we shall also have to have the window in our place open, and maybe then a couple of those tender frozen chickens will fly in. I've always had a soft spot for our feathered friends. As soon as they see me, they stretch out their necks to be tickled. Kubat starts to choke on a chicken bone, and when he can finally talk again, he looks over at Weichert for a while, and then says firmly, You'd better leave that alone, you chicken tickler. You know the rules. If they catch you at it, the shit will hit the fan, and we might well be blown away with it. After a short pause, he continues. In other words, leave the chicken tickling to those who know all about it, okay? But you can come over now and then and gnaw on a couple of bones with us, if you like. Weichert doesn't say any more, but grins bravely at us, and then shows the Obergefreiter a wide set of dentures, with his gold cap in the upper row. After that, we all get a tender piece of chicken and half a canteen lid full of fat chicken broth. We note, of course, that Kubat, as well as the Gruppenunter of Fizier, has the last word here. Warriez tells us later that his friends refer to him as Scrounger, in recognition of his genius at organizing anything edible. And, after all, the Scrounger sounds better than thief. In further conversation with the newly arrived soldiers, we get to hear several snippets of news about Schleifer Hunter of Fizier. Heisterman, whom we know from Insterberg, he is supposed to have arranged things so that he would be the Gerrita Unteroffizier in his schwadron, so that he could work with the trains and avoid frontline service. However, what Kubat then went on to say about him is disgusting. When the entire unit was on the front line, Heisterman is supposed to have made indecent assaults on Russian women, luring them to his house on the pretext of giving them work. The mountain infantry accused him of having brutally raped two young Russian girls who worked for him. He supposedly lay in wait for them one evening, then took them to his vehicle, where he violated them. I'm sure he's capable of this kind of thing. Although Heisterman denied the incident, it was investigated by higher authority, according to Scrounger. The investigation was not completed, however, as Heisterman suddenly disappeared. He left on a routine visit to a repair unit in the rear area and didn't come back. It was assumed that, while he was on his way across the Dnieper lowland, he was attacked by partisans, who would often have a go at people if they were on their own. No one knows anything for sure, but as far as I'm concerned, the chapter on Heisterman has been closed. Looking back, I can say that I certainly came across other unsavory types during the war. But none of them was as mean and degenerate as Heisterman. 17th and December Today has for some of us been a very special day. Because we have continually stuck our necks out and can still count ourselves among the living, we are being decorated with the Iron Cross Second Class and the Bronze Close Combat Bar. Fritz Hammond, Warriors and I are the ones from our age group. I can't deny that I'm rather proud, less because of the IC2 than because I can now be counted among the so-called Frunschwein. The business of decorations is a strange matter. First, of course, the leaders are decorated. Well, that goes without saying, how could we carry on if, say, a soldier received the Iron Cross Worst class and his Zugführer didn't? What would happen to the pecking order? We soldiers know how it is with the handing out of decorations. One for all, they say, and the one is always the chief and the superior. When the chiefs are taken care of, then something can also be dished out to the Indians. For example, if a regular soldier is written up for an ICI, then he really must have risked his neck. As a result, we, the Frunschweine, do not rate the decorations awarded to our superiors as highly as those at home do. Officers' decorations are usually awarded on the basis of what their soldiers contribute, when, en masse, they manage to save their officers' necks. In general, no one quarrels with this system, as long as the superior has demonstrated his ability to lead. Unfortunately, I have also met those who never remotely deserved their decorations based on their own performance. Although I would receive a higher decoration few months later, I don't rate military decorations that highly. They are, after all, very much dependent upon luck and all the brave soldiers who didn't receive any, and, what's more, all our deed comrades are undervalued. I knew brave soldiers in the close combat days of Ritzschaff and later towards the end of the war, who several times over deserved higher decorations, but never received them because their superiors had become casualties in the fighting, 
or because commanders had come and gone, and nobody was left to attest to their bravery, or commanders who perhaps didn't want to commend their men in order to reap the glory for themselves. That is the soldier's fate. In the end, it is always down to the opinion of his superior, unless because of a fortunate combination of circumstances, his contribution is so outstanding that it is drawn to the attention of higher authority. This did happen to one of our friends some months later. He received the Knight's Cross for his actions. I made notes about this incident in the spring of 1944, as we were engaged in the most horrific retreat, dragging our way through the deepest mud and mire which I have ever experienced in my life. We pulled back all the way to the bug, and from there we were transferred to Romania. This retreat took place over several months, during which many of my good mates were lost forever or, thank God, were only parted from me because of their injuries. Today, after I had received my first decoration, I had a few drinks, having kept away from them for some time. In this atmosphere, there is always a lot of talking going on, and as a result, we got to bed rather late, 18th December. During the night, it snowed again. We wash our bodies with fresh snow and afterwards have a snowball fight. In the morning sun, the snow sparkles as if diamond splinters have been scattered over it. Everything is unusually quiet. The only noise from the front is the occasional explosion or sound of gunfire, only the normal harassing fire. Yesterday, a group in the village was showing films. Part of the squadron went yesterday, and today it's our turn. When we return to our quarters from the movie, the place smells seductive. Katya and Matka surprise us with a Russian borscht soup, a sort of hot pot. It contains sauerkraut, stuffed tomatoes, and of course plenty of canned beef, and it tastes superb. The soup makes a real change and is delightful. Paul Adam is frequently hanging around Katya. They laugh a lot together. I do not begrudge him. As I wander up to them, Katya is showing him some family pictures. A couple of them are painted portraits. Who is that? I ask, and Katya becomes serious. She says something I don't understand. Paul has learned Russian very well, and he tells me that they're paintings of her brothers. They also are in the war. One of them has painted most of the pictures himself. He is reckoned to be a good portrait artist. Then suddenly, Katya begins to weep. She curses the war and then raises her rough hands and calls out, Wina Kaput, and again, Wina Kaput, which means the war must end. Poor Katya. We want the war to end too but who knows if it ever will. 19th of December. Today is different. There is no more peace. Immediately after I wake up, a rolling barrage starts, but as it continues, it gets louder and louder. It's the long-awaited major Russian assault. Will the troops in the trenches on the MBL be able to hold the enemy back? No. He breaks through our lines, and immediately thereafter the alarm is given. As we sit in the vehicles, Katya comes to us and says her goodbyes. She has tears in her eyes. Does she sense something? This engagement will be one of our heaviest yet, with very many dead and wounded. It's a good thing we don't know about this beforehand. Katya follows our vehicle for quite a distance, and as we start to pick up speed, she waves to us until we disappear round a bend. The vehicles drive to the village exit and then take cover in a natural hollow in the terrain. The noise of combat in front of us gets louder and louder. We jump down from our vehicles and await the order to engage. Then suddenly, several T-34s appear in front of us. They are only a few hundred meters away on top of a ridge and are firing into the village. Word spreads like wildfire that the enemy has broken through the infantry lines and sections of the mountain infantry and have apparently rolled over the artillery position in the gorge a few kilometers from the village. The Russian troops that are now pouring through the breach in the line are already moving out the German prisoners. Behind us, our assault guns and tanks drive into position and an aggressive exchange begins between them and the T-34s. The T-34s make very good targets, sitting as they do on the snow-covered high ground. Before long, we have taken out over 20 of them, with only two losses on our side. The rest of the T-34s seek safety. Towards noon, we, the Panzer Grenadier, go into action. We have to cross open country without any cover. The enemy has been waiting for this, and he greets us with a furious bombardment using all his heavy weapons. All hell breaks loose around us, and a tumultuous inferno of violence and unceasing destruction comes pouring down. A score of combat aircraft swarm over our heads, raining bombs on us and our tanks. The tanks rapidly make smoke to avoid being seen. 
In the meantime, we are lying flat on the ground without any cover, wishing that we were moles so that we could crawl to safety. The ground beneath us shakes with the impacts and explosions. All around us we hear painful cries from the wounded, calling out for the medics. We run forward through the thundering hell, with only one thought in mind, to somehow find some kind of cover there in front of us. Even though we make it through the artillery crossfire, death waits for us a thousand times over. The Russian machine gunners hammer away at us with all barrels, and the enemy anti-tank weapons and divisional artillery fire at our every movement. Bursts of hot bullets swish by me and tear up the thin snow cover around. I can feel a hot burning on my skin and throw myself on the ground again. Unfortunately, I hit my chin on the steel jacket of my machine gun, which I have allowed to slide off my shoulder when I hit the ground. For seconds, I am knocked out, but I jump up again and bound over towards my right, where I have seen a flat, snow-covered hedge. The bullets are fizzing into the ground. For seconds, I am reminded how many times over the last few weeks I have sped through the enemy's reign of fire. Up till now I have been lucky and have, with God's help, always come through. Will I manage it this time? I do now what I have always done. I run, bent double, driven on by fear that I'll be hit any moment. My body seems as if it's electrically charged, and I feel hot waves running down my back. Sweat pours from my forehead down into my eyes, making them sting. Every now and then, I throw myself flat onto the ground and stick my head in between my shoulders like a tortoise. Thinking that a hit low down in my body would not cost me my life, I prefer to cover the distance to the hedge crawling flat on my stomach, feet first. But I jump up again and run on, the machine gun on my shoulder. It seems like an eternity has passed before my assistant and I reach the hedge. Finally, we get there and find a little bit of cover. On the churned-up field behind us, the wounded are whimpering, for they can no longer run. They lie amongst the many dead bodies and roll over in pools of blood, often in their death throes. Less than ten paces behind me, I can see Willie Krause lying in a pool of blood. Willie is dead, and still has the gun mounting from Fritz Hammond tied to his back. Beside me lies a young panzer grenadier from the group belonging to Dreyer. He is bleeding from his head and is trying to reach the mounting. He can't reach it. I see him hit by a burst of machine gun fire, and his bullet-riddled body just collapses. Paul Adam, who has also seen it, lies next to me and coughs from wheezing lungs. His eyes flicker. He had untied his mounting during the run and carried it in his right hand, so as to present the enemy with a more difficult target. Behind us, an armored personnel carrier tries to collect the wounded. Further along the hedge, the Russians are lying in trenches. Machine guns from the light platoons are now firing from the flank into them. Our attack goes on. Our tanks and assault guns advance along a broad front and fire into the Soviet positions. Then the Russian artillery begins to open up again. This time the shells land between us but also on the Russian lines. The Russians hurriedly fire green flares, and the next rounds land only in the area between us. Hurry! Fire green tracers! Someone yells and immediately the lights zip away from our lines into the sky. The trick works. The next shells whine over us into the quagmire beyond. With support from our tanks, we are making pretty good progress. The platoons on our right are already tossing hand grenades into the Russian trenches. I've inserted a fresh magazine in my machine gun and am now storming forward with the others towards the trenches. The Russians are surprised and disorganized. Some of them start to jump out of the trenches and run towards their rear without their rifles. Two of them are still standing behind a heavy machine gun and firing. Still at full pelt, I empty my magazine at the pair of them and hit them. Then I slip on the ice on the rim of the trench and dive headlong into it. A shining metal point glints in front of me and I feel a rip on my right cheek. I hold my machine gun in my right hand and am about to get up just as the Russian in front of me is about to run his bayonet through me. At that moment he crumples from a burst of fire. Fritz Kuczynski is standing on the edge of the trench with his submachine gun. But before he can join me in the trench, he too buckles and sinks to the ground. I grab hold of his camouflage suit and someone helps me pull him into the trench. He moans and grimaces in pain. The other man is a really young medic, his face as white as a sheet. He mumbles something, and we both stare at the blood-soaked spot on the Fritz Koshinsky's white camouflage battle dress. The medic wants to turn him a little bit on his side, but Fritz presses both hands on his stomach and groans. Just leave me. It hurts. 
the medic nods. Shot in the stomach, he remarks. Fritz tries to support himself. I can already feel it running into my stomach. I want to give him some encouragement and mutter something about sewing him up. Then I give him my hand and say, Until then, Fritz, we didn't have much time. Good thing you got him. He nods and tries to smile. The fact is, Fritz Koshinsky saved my life. Another time it will be someone else, and I'll save others in turn. That is the way of things at the front. Everyone tries as best as he can to save his own life, as well as those of his mates. No one talks about it much. It is the natural thing to do. The attack continues. The enemy trenches are still not all rolled up. I run after the others until I catch up with Paul Adam, who is the last of them. He turns around and says with a worried look, Good God, you are bleeding like a pig. Where did you get that? For the first time, I notice that blood from my cheek is running down my neck. However, I can't feel any pain. Then Waldemar Krakel squeezes through the narrow trench and wipes my cheek with some bandage. Lucky for you, it's only a surface wound, says Waldi, and covers the cut with a plaster. When I tell him his good friend Fritz has been shot in the stomach, he's shaken and says, stomach wounds are very bad. I only hope that Fritz didn't fill his belly before he was hit. Everyone knows what Waldi means by that. Although no one orders us not to eat too much before going into action, old hands have warned us never to fill our bellies with food beforehand. If you get shot in the stomach and it is empty, you have a much better chance of surviving than if it's full. No one knows for sure whether it's true, but it sounds plausible. Many soldiers, including me, follow this advice. Others can't help themselves and just have to eat. More to the point, they can't resist tucking into their cold rations when they arrive, even just before going into action. Some eat during the drive up to the jump-off point, with comments such as, what's gone is gone, and I can't leave good food behind for Ivan to eat. I get the impression that many of the men who speak in this way do so to calm their nerves, from which all of us suffer just before combat. Fervently hoping that Fritz Koshinsky will survive his stomach wound, we press onwards in the narrow trench. At one point, there are so many dead Russian soldiers lying on top of each other that we can crawl over them only with difficulty. Poor devils. Most of them have faces as young as ours. They were our enemy and they wanted to kill us. Now they can harm us no more and are lying still and silent, like many of our comrades on the snow-covered fields behind us. The only difference is the uniform, and perhaps they are not, as are our dead, given a wooden cross on their graves in Dunyaprovka. But when time permits are buried in a mass grave and incinerated by our rear echelon troops, when we have successfully ejected the enemy from his assembly area. During darkness, we withdraw a short distance and occupy a new line. We're pleased that there are defensive positions all over the place and also shelter from tanks. Digging out new positions in the frozen ground would call for a backbreaking effort. Even now the sweat is pouring from us as we break up blocks of deep frozen earth to camouflage our machine gun in its new firing position. During the night we can hear the enemy return and start to dig himself in out there in front of us. We can clearly hear him using picks and other tools to break the ground up. He stops work only when we send a mortar round or two across. Since the Russians are so busy digging in, we are spared further close combat, and so our fresh supplies of food and ammunition arrive unhindered. From the drivers, we hear the bad news about the number of dead and wounded this attack has cost us. Apart from the loss of the commander of the 2nd Battalion, we are told that our former squadron chef and current commander of the 1st Battalion has also been wounded, as have two other officers from the battalion and a senior doctor. The old man is also supposed to have taken a hit in the left arm. The leadership of our squadron is now reported to have been turned over to a lieutenant whom nobody knows. It's said that our squadron has suffered seven dead and 21 wounded, among them Willie Kraus and the young Panzer Grenadier Hanka, who comes from our heavy weapons section. Two more wounded soldiers are added to the total, and they've only been with us for a couple of days. The mortar section report four wounded. The second squadron is supposed to have suffered particularly heavy casualties. It now has only 19 men, with many wounded and 12 dead. This has been a very bad day, and it does not pass unnoticed. It tempers all the feelings of confidence I have, 
which, as a winner, you often experience, when I think of the high price we have had to pay. 20 of December. Paul, Adam, and I work all night to improve our defenses, and as a result can keep ourselves warm. The frost got more severe during the night, and we were given a blanket to help. As dawn breaks, there's no sign of the enemy. The Russians are masters of camouflage. After an hour or so, the clouds thicken and it begins to snow. This is fine from our point of view, since the snow covers everything with its white sheet and therefore camouflages our position. Paul, forever peering through the telescopic sight, spots a couple of mounds of snow in the distance, under which we suspect the enemy is hiding. However, the Russians are keeping quiet. Towards noon, we are subjected to intensive mortar fire, and shortly afterwards, on our right flank, there is some close-range shooting. We can also hear tank and anti-tank guns, but all is quiet directly to our front. After nightfall, we can again hear the picks and shovels at work, and the noise lasts well into the night. The enemy is reinforcing his jump-off positions, and he will again try to throw us out of the MBL. Orders from the regiment are that we stay in our holes until the danger has passed, and the infantry and mountain troops will take over the positions again. Fat chance. 24 December. The day begins with poor visibility, but it doesn't snow. During the night we were supplied with straw, which helps to insulate the frozen ground and keeps the feet a bit warmer. The enemy is firing continuously with his mortars and machine guns. We can't raise our heads, so we keep quiet and don't give him the advantage of discovering our positions, assuming he doesn't attack. In the evening, it's quiet again. Waldy and Dreyer come and see us. They tell us that an enemy deserter has divulged that the Russians are preparing for a major assault. We therefore get together several extra boxes of ammunition for our position. During the night, it is really cold, and there is no way we can even think of sleeping. With every breath of air, tiny icicles form on our stubble. I suggest digging out a tunnel at the narrow end of our trench, knee height, so that we can crawl into it for sleeping. Paul is delighted with the idea, and so we make a start. After digging straight into the bank for about half a meter, we excavate at a right angle so as to protect us from splinters. The frozen walls give us additional protection against being crushed. 22 to 23 December. The front has been quiet, and we are asking ourselves if the Soviets are going to be as tolerant over Christmas. It would be nice, but we don't trust them. We are told that the spies has prepared something special for us at the front line. We hope the Russians won't disturb us on Holy Night. 24 of December. It's been freezing cold again during the night, with a heavy frost, but we didn't notice this in our sleeping tunnel. I covered myself with a blanket and the ground sheet, and between shifts, I slept really solidly. Soon the mortar rounds are whining in over us. The Russians are again trying to surprise us with sudden shelling, and sometimes they unfortunately manage to catch us in the open. As I hear the rush in the air overhead, I prick my ears like a fox and listen intently to the sounds. My ears are so well attuned that every type of noise along the front is picked up. In front of me nothing has changed, only the mortars continuing to fire at our positions for another half an hour. When it's all quiet, Gefreiter Plischke, whom we all know as the professor because we respect him for his knowledge, from the other heavy weapons section runs up excitedly and tells me that, sadly, Stabskefreiter Dreyer has been killed by a direct hit from a mortar round. Two young Panzer Grenadier were also killed. He has also learned from a medic that Fritz Koshinsky died from his stomach wound while at the main dressing station. This is bad news, reminding us how near death is all around us. Much to our surprise, the day passes without an attack. The clouds are low, and now and again it snows. Often we hear the sharp report of a rifle shot, and shortly afterwards the bullet exploding with a light crack. The Russian snipers are using explosive rounds, which tear large holes in any flesh they hit. When it becomes too much for our machine gunners, they answer with a short burst. We get our rations while it is still dark, and because it's Christmas Eve, we receive potato salad and a lump of meat. Instead of coffee, the canteens are filled with tea and rum. In addition, each man receives a front Kempfer pection, two packages of cigarettes and Christmas biscuits. Our Spies had held up delivery of the packages from home for several days in order to hand them over to us tonight. Paul and I each receive ours. We place everything on the ground sheet, as well as some sweets, lovingly packaged up by my mother. I discover a small artificial pine tree branch, decorated with silver threads and dotted with small toadstools. 
A Christmas tree candle and holder are also included. Great, now we can celebrate Christmas, says Paul, holding up the branch. Yes, why not? I agree. Using the ground sheet weighted down with some ammunition cases, we cover our narrow foxhole. Then we crouch down and light our candle on the branch, which Paul has laid on top of the flattened paper cartons from our packages. We think about our loved ones at home and munch on the biscuits. The tea with the rum goes to our heads a bit. Then Paul interrupts the silence and says, Merry Christmas, I nod. Merry Christmas, Paul. I wonder about him as he suddenly breaks into a carol. He is usually the one who waits until someone else does something. He begins with, Silent night, holy night. And I mumble along. But our voices sound pathetic, and Paul notices this as well. After the first few lines, he begins another carol. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. Paul's voice sounds soft and dejected. Then he stops in the middle and shrugs his shoulders. It doesn't work. I understand what he means. It is not the best moment to sing Christmas carols. Too much has happened recently, and we can't help but think of those of our comrades who can't be here to celebrate with us. Only a few hours ago, we lost Dreyer and the two young Panzer Grenadier, and three days earlier, Willy Krauss, Fritz Koshinsky, and the other young Grenadier Hanka, to mention a few. They were looking forward to Christmas back in the barracks as well. We understand that for some of them, there are still mail and packages waiting in the orderly room. Those who have written them do not yet know that they will not be reading their mail. Lost in these thoughts, we suddenly hear the familiar whoosh over us and then the impact of shells. So Ivan is not going to give us any respite this Christmas Eve after all. We blow the candle out and peer into the darkness. Over the entire front, tracer bullets are rising into the night sky. Well, we at least have festive lights on Christmas Eve, says Paul rather bitterly. Still, nothing moves in front of us. But then we hear the unique noise of incoming rockets. Stalin Orgon! yells a soldier from our light platoon. We duck down into our tunnel in the ground, and the next minute we hear an explosion and a piece of rocket shrapnel hits one of our ammunition crates and tumbles into our foxhole. The Russians play their organ twice more before it becomes quiet again. 25 December. At eight in the morning, the Russian drum roll breaks loose over us like a devastating hurricane. We crawl into our tunnel and come up only now and then to check the conditions in front of us. We're ready to defend ourselves, but we know that this will begin only after the enemy has advanced so far that our defensive fire can be effectively directed. Even though I have experienced enemy barrage fire with heavy weapons several times before, I can't help but get anxious all over again. The endless waiting makes me nervous and restless. I know that the barrage will lift sooner or later, and only then will the actual fighting begin. However, until that happens, a thousand thoughts swirl around in my head. With these thoughts come memories of earlier engagements. Images appear before my eyes, and I see again the despair and the disaster at Ritschoff, on the dawn, bitter experiences which I thought I'd long forgotten, but which now stand again before me. Again I am seized by terror as I was at that time, and I pray quietly and fervently that I will again come through this attack without injury. The grueling shelling lasts nearly two hours. Then someone yells loudly, they're coming. Finally, I take a deep breath, but I am uneasy because I know that again, some will not survive this battle. It is, however, also my freedom from the grinding barrage, which I'm unable to ignore by willpower alone. As soon as I get behind the heavy machine gun with Paul, my thoughts are all concentrated on the advancing enemy. The Russian artillery has lifted a little, and the heavy rounds now howl over our heads. When we suddenly open fire, we are filled only with the desire to defend ourselves from the enemy in front of us and prevent him from being able to overrun our positions. The shells from our defensive fire are now screaming over our heads from behind. It is as though a hundred cannon are loosing off their deadly projectiles all at once. In front of our artillery, a defensive line of tanks and assault guns has rapidly driven up and is now firing point-blank into the enemy assault waves. The enemy does not have a chance to come even close to our defensive positions. He has already been destroyed before we can attack him with our infantry weapons. In the end, our machine guns stop a few small groups which have been able to escape our deadly crossfire and who still attempt to reach our positions. During the evening, we learn that our shells have been fitted with impact fuses, 
which caused the rounds to burst on striking the target and with their anti-personnel splinter charges, cause havoc amongst troops. This results in a terrible massacre for the enemy, and we couldn't help but feel a certain satisfaction. When all said and done, he had dared to disturb us during our holiday. During the late afternoon, the Soviets try to dislodge us with another barrage and advance. This attempt is just as unsuccessful as the first. Now we know that their intentions were to disturb us during Christmas, which the Russians do not celebrate until the New Year. Our losses were within reason, although we did suffer several dead, and one dead is one too many. We were told that the enemy has lost 35 T-34s throughout the sector. It appears as if he has decided to calm down for a while, because for the next few days we would see no combat. 28 December. The day at the front has passed quietly. We believe that the enemy has enough to do and can leave us alone. 29th of December. The troops who occupied these positions earlier are relieving us. They take over their old foxholes on the main battle line, from which they had been ejected by the Russians in their last major assault. We're delighted to be able to return to our quarters and make ourselves half-human again. If any of our friends back at quarters hope to recognize Zeus, they will have to look pretty carefully as we are bearded and covered with dirt. It is surprising how quickly our attitudes have changed. As we sit in the vehicles and get closer to the barracks, we joke and talk about what we will do when we get back. But as soon as we see Katya standing there, waiting for us with tears in her eyes, we become serious. Again, she has placed small woven wooden crosses on the bed covers of our fallen comrades. Because she wants to hide her tears from us, she runs quickly away after a brief welcome, calling back as she does so, Rabati, Rabati, which means something like, I must work. After we have cleaned up, we collapse and sleep until evening. Then we get our rations, in addition to which each man also receives a bottle of brandy. I give my bottle to Waldy, because in his grief over the loss of his friend, he is sitting still in the corner pouring alcohol into himself. In the evening, I am again with Paul, Adam, as well as Katya and her mother. We are learning Russian and enjoying ourselves with our gibberish. Once, when Katya touched Paul's hand, he looked into her shining blue eyes and blushed. Aha, uh -huh, I thought, there is some flirting going on here. When I got tired and left, Paul and Katya stayed behind. It's 31 December, and it has snowed again during the night. The new white mantle is dry and powdery, just as we like it. Weikert reckons that our men up front will manage to hold the enemy back. This subject is the most important topic of conversation right now. Weikert may well be right. In the meantime, Unterofizer Fender from the mortar section has come over to see us. He doesn't know any more than we do, but he suggests that we should get ready, because orders to mount up could come at any time. We wait and wonder. The artillery barrage recedes after an hour. Then we hear our own artillery fire, from new positions in front of the village. We assume that this fire is aimed at the attackers. Then our Ober comes along. I can hear him talking to Unterofizier Fender, telling him that the positions up front were reinforced yesterday and that it was obvious that the enemy would try to reduce the bridgehead further. He, too, expects that we will be called upon, but this would depend on the situation up at the front line and on the orders from the staffs. The Ober would be proved right. The deployment order comes an hour later. Most of the men have already climbed aboard the vehicles, but we are missing Katya, who never forgets to say goodbye to us before we leave. It's early in the morning, and she's probably busy peeling potatoes in the kitchen used by the mountain troops. As if reading our thoughts, Katya suddenly comes running out from between the huts, the powdery snow rising in great puffs under her long felt boots. Like all Russian women, she has a warm babushka scarf on her head, which from a distance makes all Russian women look old. It's only when Katya stands in front of us that we recognize her youthful face, which is warm from running and flushed. She is out of breath and says hurriedly, in explanation, Soldier says I work in kitchen. I go. Soldier says no. I say it does not matter and come. Charasho Katya Nyanada. You don't need to excuse yourself, I say in my best Russian accent. My mates, who are already on the truck, stretch out their hands to say goodbye to her as usual. Beside me stand the young Panzer Grenadier Schroeder and Paul Adam. Katya takes Schroeder's cap off and strokes his bushy fair hair. He grins happily, but he's blushing. He turns round and jumps up onto the truck with the others. When she then gives Paul her hands, I can see her fingers twisting nervously. 
She holds Paul's hand for longer than usual and gazes at him. Then she turns abruptly away, unable to hold back her tears. I have never seen Katya so broken up. Not quite knowing what to do, I put my arm around her and stutter in German, Take it easy, Katya. We will all come back safely. Just you see? She doesn't understand, but perhaps she can sense what I am saying. She looks at Paul, who is now climbing aboard the truck. I'm the last to climb up, but she holds me back by the arm and whispers, Pashausta, you will look after Paul and little Schroeder. I nod. Karasho Katya, I promise you I will. Then I too jump up on the truck. The vehicle moves off and we wave, as we always do. But Katya doesn't wave back. She stands there with her arms hanging down and with tears running down her cheeks. Then suddenly her body twitches and she clenches her fists. She shakes them towards the sky and we sense rather than hear her desperate call, Wina Kaput. It is a cry of desperation and protest against the murderous war and perhaps also a complaint to the Almighty for permitting such destruction and unending sorrow. Even as our vehicle pulls to the right after about a hundred meters, Katya is still standing at the same spot staring after us. Nobody says anything. Some are drawing quickly on their cigarettes or, like Waldi, are producing clouds of smoke from their pipes. Each is occupied with his own private thoughts. My thoughts revolve around Katya and why she is behaving so strangely today. Is it the long period of uncertainty and the buildup of excitement which has made all of us so nervous? Or was it a problem with the kitchen wallas, who didn't want her to come outside and see us? Her behavior is really rather odd, as if she knows or senses something. Guess what? The professor looks at Weichert. I found the evidence in the snow in front of the truck. What do you mean? Weichert looks quizzical. Now don't pretend to be so surprised, the professor chides him and winks at us. You had your lighter between your teeth as you were getting ready to climb up, but when Katya came running, you dropped it in your excitement. We drive on through the trough of a Rachel and listen to the noise of combat, which draws ever closer. Then suddenly we are taken under fire by some infantry guns and have to drive back into the Rachel. As we dismount, mortar shells are coming in over us and one vehicle is hit. ATG rounds and tank grenades are zipping through the air and are landing amongst our tank unit. The tanks fire back and destroy several enemy tanks, halting the attack. As we move into a counterattack, our retreating troops from the front line are coming towards us. They are in panic and are carrying their wounded comrades with them. An Unteroffizier tells us that the enemy, after a heavy artillery barrage, has stormed their positions with many tanks with mounted infantry. He has inflicted serious casualties, dead and wounded. We move slowly forward with 20 tanks and heavy weapons in support. At first things go quite well, but then we come within range of the enemy's heavy weapons. There is next to no cover on the open fields, and again we take many casualties, in particular among the light troops. Then we manage to clear the MSR and press the enemy back a considerable distance south. At nightfall we withdraw a little and occupy a line which already has protective foxholes, which we only need to tidy up. Because we have retaken these positions, the HBL has been shortened somewhat. There is quite a bit of activity during the night. First, the enemy bombards the empty positions in front of ours with his heavy guns. Then, realizing that they are empty, he increases his range. A little later, as it begins to snow, Soviet infantry suddenly appear in front of our positions. We see them coming towards us in their snowsuits in the light of our tracers. They have no chance of even getting close to our positions, and they suffer heavy losses, and their attack is stopped. We continue to hear the calls for help from their seriously wounded, but no one can help them. Now the Soviets are sitting nervously in their foxholes in front of us. Once in a while they fire off tracers, which climb into the dark night sky and then fall back, flickering for a moment on the snow and casting leaping shadows like the fluttering wings of a dying bird. A few snowflakes sail around in the air. It appears that we now have a bit of peace again. Someone comes to our foxhole from behind us and asks, First gunner. Yes, what's the news? I reply. I recognize Bittner by his voice. Did you get your rations? No. Bloody nuisance. What's taking them so long? Bittner is annoyed. That's right, says Paul Adam. The professor should have been back long ago. The ration truck is not that far away. You can hear the canteen containers clanging. Fritz Hamann, who is also kneeling at my foxhole, says, I hope the professor hasn't got lost in the snow. 
He can't see very well in daylight, let alone in the dark. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill, I try to reassure them. Kramer's with him. Another quarter of an hour passes. The men in our neighboring platoons have neither seen nor heard anything of the two of them. We suspect that they're either in front of us or have got lost in no man's land. Should we let loose with some tracer, suggests Paul. I wouldn't, Waldy counters correctly. If they're in front of us, we might hit them, and Ivan would shoot back. Waldy has barely finished speaking when, from the Soviet side, flares zoom up into the sky. At the same moment, machine gun and rifle fire interrupt the quiet of the front line. Flares go up from our lines and light up the even snowfield ahead of us. Nothing. There is no movement. Gradually, the firing dies down. What's going on? Is Ivan nervous? This often happens. All that's needed is for someone to shoot into the night and immediately the other side answers and fires a flare. It is now quiet again, but we're wide awake, listening intently. Another half an hour passes, then Paul nudges me and indicates that he has heard some soft crunching noises in the snow ahead of us. Abruptly, a muffled voice from the next foxhole interrupts our anxious listening. Go ahead, fire a flare, Hines, says someone. A flare chases into the night sky and explodes above with a muffled bang. Immediately, a shower of tiny lights rains down over the area in front of us, bathing the field. Didn't some figures throw themselves down in the snow there in front of us? One more, says the same voice as before, and another flare whizzes into the sky. As it explodes, we can clearly see some figures in snowsuits, throwing themselves onto the ground and merging into the whiteness. I pull my ammunition belt tight and lower the barrel onto the attackers. Hold it! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! yells a voice from the field in front of us. Waldy yells back, Professor Kramer, is that you? Instead of answering, two figures in white camouflage suits run towards us. Behind them, the flash of a submachine gun tells of a burst of fire chasing after them. 